the first book I, I picked up was this, Unidentified Flying Objects, the report on This is a book by Edward J. Ruppel, who was the, the uh, leader of, uh, I mean, the, the head of, of uh, Operation Blue Book. He quit in total disgust. He said that he believed he was being played for a sucker and that the government would never let Americans know what UFOs came from. But out of this book is a lot of information. So what I've done is I brought my actual research with me. Where did the military first become involved with UFOs? In 19, no, September 23rd in 1947, three months after Arnold saw his flight, the commanding general of the Air Technical Insurance Center, in, excuse me, Intelligence Center, in answer to a verbal request, asked the ATIC to, to, to do a report. They didn't ask him if UFOs were real, they asked him to report on whether they were uh, from somewhere else that was from Russia. This was their main concern. Uh, they accepted that instantly. This is what they said. No conceivable way any aircraft could perform would, that would match the reported maneuvers of the UFOs. As far as any of ours go, they studied the Germans, the German technology. They said there was no way. They went on and, and they, they decided to go a little further. So they started Project Grudge. And in Project Grudge, Rubel reports, everything was being evaluated on the premise that UFOs didn't exist. So they were, even though they were saying in their secret reports, UFOs existed and they were a threat to our society, they were reporting to us through their reports that they didn't exist. Uh, one of the, the most important findings of Grudge that you never hear about, it's in this book, <coughs> It says, this was a, 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 an exper uh, I mean, a study done by Dr. J. E. Liff of the RAND Corporation. He analyzed the presumed cha characteristics of an extraterrestrial spaceship, and he concluded that the actions attributed to the flying objects seem inconsistent with the requirements for space travel. So at this point in the, in the, in the, in the early 50s, the UFO, the, the government had decided the UFOs did exist, they, had, they were intelligently controlled, and they were not from outer space. At this point, they began to look for, for people who would report on UFOs the way they wanted to hear about them, not the way it was. If a reporter came to them and said, boy, I've been studying this, and I really want to know about it, they would give them no information. We're talking about the, the Air Force intelligence people. Uh, finally, they found a man named Stanley Shallot. He published an article in the Saturday Evening Post. And, and if you read the article, if you go back and read it, it was published on uh, April the 30th, 1949. If you go back and read it, you'll see that as you start reading it, he totally ridicules anybody that would even think of it. By the time you get to the end of it, you don't want anything to do with UFOs. So at that point, at that point, the CIA stepped in. They formed a, a committee called the Robinson Committee. The Robinson Committee, which the top scientist was Heinrich, this committee was formed with the published reasoning that they were going to study everything about UFOs, but the underlying reasons behind it were that they were going to figure out ways to dupe the public into thinking it was ridiculous. The, the other problem they had, the other problem that they had was that there were certain people, there were certain people who believed in UFOs. They had to do something about this. In 1953, the C, this is from a, a book called Science and the UFO by Jenny Randalls, and everybody knows Jenny Randalls, I'm sure. In 1953, the CIA conceived the Robinson Panel, a secret group of top scientists who met for the 14th of July through the 18th. Their stated purpose for meeting was to evaluate UFOs. The real purpose was to secretly plan ways of debunking and dis discrediting these sightings. As Randall's and Warren and report, quote, the real recommendation spoke of using cartoons like Walt Disney to make funny UFO movies. This would both ridicule witnesses to stop them reporting and alleviate fears that UFOs might be potentially hostile. Surveillance of UFO groups was suggested. So their meeting was to find out ways how to dupe the public. Now, they already had they already had a propaganda machine in, in place. It was called Hollywood. The, the, during the war, they used people like Ronald Reagan, 
John Wayne, Robert Mitchum, etc., to glorify the war. They took over with the UFO films. Every UFO film from the 50s, if you look at it, is in black and white like movie tone news. There's a narrator in the background like movie tone news that people have been used to sitting at and watching for years. And at the very end, you see the, the hero and the heroine standing at the end, looking out into space and saying, do you think they'll return? And he says, oh, if they do, we'll be ready for them. So this is how, they, this is how, this is actually where the idea that UFOs come from outer space came from. The government put it into our minds through the media. You never hear, they, you never hear a UFO on television without hearing from outer space. You never hear flying saucer without hearing terrestrial. They always put them together so that our mind has become associated with that. Yet they have no proof, none whatsoever. So I got to, I got to thinking about that. I got to thinking about you never see UFOs out of our atmosphere. But they've never seen UFOs coming in, in, in with, the, with the big telescopes. They've seen little cahoche. They've seen strings of pearls going and hitting planets. But they've never seen any type of vehicle coming from outer space. Even when you see them on television, the shuttle, you always see the UFO between Earth and the shuttle. You never see them in outer space. So could put, putting all these things together, I began to wonder. And then, then I read another book. This book called They Knew Too Much About Flying Saucers. This is by Greg Barker. It tells the story of a man named Albert K. Bender. <coughs> Albert K. Bender is the father of UFO groups. He started the very first UFO groups in the late 40s. As, as time went on and the, and the CIA began moving in to the groups, they began convincing the groups to also say UFOs came from outer space. Well, Albert K. Bender wouldn't go along with the program. He said he was going to continue looking into what he looked into. Now that he was, he was looking into three possibilities. He was looking into the possibility that they were from outer space, the possibility that they were from someplace on Earth that we didn't know about, and the possibility that they were in, from inside the Earth, which was a very strange possibility, but it went along with the hollow Earth theory. Now, what happened to, to, to Alfred K. Bender? Well, he put out a newsletter, just as most UF group, groups do. He was, the, he was the first one to come up with net networking worldwide. UFO groups from all over the world were networking with him. He, his organization was called the International Flying Saucer Bureau. He, he put out, in his last newsletter that he put out, that mentioned flying saucers, because that's what they were called by this. In his last newsletter, the headline went that he was going to reveal a very important thing about this whole situation in his next issue. Between that issue and the next issue, he got out of the flying saucer business. He would have nothing else to do with it. He, wouldn't, he, he, he continued publishing his newsletter to, to, to pay the people's prescriptions to make sure to meet their demand, but he never mentioned flying saucers again. Several of his friends, including Greg, Greg Barker, several of his friends kept pressing him, what happened? What made you, you know, you were all ready to reveal all this stuff and now you're out of it. What happened? He finally agreed to have an interview with them. They came, they came to his house, three of them, and they sat down and he interviewed them. Every question he, they, he said, I will talk about anything except what they told me not to talk about. Every question they asked him about UFOs, he would say, I don't know. Until they got to a question and asked him, does this have anything to do with the Shaver mystery? At that point, he didn't say a word. He wouldn't answer the question. They started questioning him again. They asked him more questions. Once again, they asked him about the Shaver mystery. He changed the subject. He would not talk about it. The whole, the whole, transcript is in this book. Now, taking what I had already heard about how the government had put it into our minds that UFOs were from outer space and we had no proof that they were at all, and taking in mind that this was this his claim and what had happened to him is three men in black, this is the original three men in black, three men in black came to him and told him to keep his mouth shut. Now, they, they also contacted a gentleman in Australia who was one of his contacts, and, and he started talking at first, and he said one of the things 
that him and Bender were doing together was they were tracking, trying to track the UFOs. And they were tracking and that most of them were going to Antarctica. So these are the two things that Bender was looking at when they sent the original men in black to shut him up. He was looking at where the UFOs were inside the earth and why were UFOs heading for Antarctica. I took those points and I, 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 I took them a little further. It, according to writer John A. Keel in UFOs Operation Trojan Horse 1970, quote, Small groups of believers quickly sprung up. These believers immediately accepted the extraterrestrial hypothesis, and they spent the next 20 years advocating that idea. Their curricular for evidence was very strict. Such evidence had to be non-terrestrial, but this was a vicious circle. If a piece of metal fell from a UFO and proved to be ordinary aluminum, it was discarded. If it proved to be made of a puzzling, unidentified alloy, it still proved nothing unless the source could be proven. And so they went from that point. So I said, well, then the first serious step to any study of UFO is to throw away the idea that they're extraterrestrial. Throw that away. Start with the fact that they exist. Where do they come from? If they, come from, if they do come from Earth, then there must be some evidence. Here's a, here's a quote, here's a quote from, from um, J. Allen Hynek. He was the head scientist for Project Grudge in the, in the late 60s. And here's a report from the August 1976 issue of UFO Report. Quote, in recent times, I have come to support less and less that UFOs are spacecraft from other worlds. There are just too many things going against the theory. I think we must begin to re-examine the evidence. We must begin to look closer to home. Right. In 1976, there was a a committee formed by the French government that had the same power as our NASA. This committee was, was I can't pronounce it, but it's G-E-D-O-G, -E I believe. But the committee <coughs> was studying UFOs without American influence. This is, this is what they said. We would study this without American push or influence. The head scientist went on the radio and he said, we have come to the conclusion that UFOs are from our planet, but that it will shake up the people so bad that the governments can't figure out how to reveal it. So now this was a, a study <coughs> done by the French. Well, it was immediately squelched, but you can't find it. You can't find paperwork from it. I have some. So this committee find it, Heinrich find it, different ones over the years have said something's not right. So I said, well, let's, let, let's Let's look at some of the cases. Let's take the whole outer space idea away from them. Let's, let's look at, has there ever been any, anything found? Yes, there have been pieces of metal found. Well, as soon as there are pieces of metal found, they're not from outer space. Anything that goes wrong with it, uh, excuse me, I know some of you guys are probably being fine or whatever, but the groups, the head groups, immediately jump up and say it's a phony, okay? So I said, well, let me look at some of the metal findings. The first piece of the first piece of findings I looked at was, was the 1897 Aurora, Texas airship crash. Once again, it's one that UFO groups, heads of groups, says, well, it's a phony. But once again, there is no evidence pointing towards that. What I'm saying is let's study the evidence on each of these things. They say it's phony because it doesn't fit what they want it to fit. In the Aurora, Texas airship crash, over 100 people saw the crash. It was reported in papers all over the country. You can go to the library and look it up in the New York Times. It was reported by ministers. It was reported by policemen. It was reported by school teachers. It was reported by all kinds of people. Something crashed. They also say that something, somebody was, a little being was buried in the graveyard. Okay, in, in 19, in, uh, in, in uh, not, last year, 1994, uh, that TV show called Hidden Encounters got a hold of some of this metal. They got it from this lady who her father had, had gone down into the well where this thing had crashed over what? Had gone down to the bottom of the well and dug up some pieces. <coughs> they showed pictures of his hands. They were swollen like melons from touching this metal. Okay? They went and they, 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 they had the metal analyzed. The metal came up to be 99% aluminum pure aluminum. 
we're talking 1897. <coughs> Ufologists said, well, somebody phoned that up and it's, it, it, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a hoax. Fine, show me the evidence. Then the next one, you know, we, everybody hears about Arnold. Arnold is, you know, that's when UFOs started. When, when Kenneth Arnold started, that's cool. They've been around forever. But the modern day UFOs actually started in a place called Murray Island, Washington. Just a few days before Kenneth Arnold. Sometimes you wonder if maybe one's not covered yet. But what happened there? Well, this is from, this is from Harold T. Wilkins, Flying Saucers on the Attack, his 1954 book. If you want to learn about UFOs, go back prior to 1953, because after 1953, when the Robinson panel was convened <coughs> and the Condor report were CIA controlled. So anything before that is going to be just bull. It's going to be good mixed in with the bad, but go read the old books. Here's what Harold T. Wilkins said in 1954. A military intelligence officer called on Mr. Arnold and took away from him every piece of metal he had from Murray Island. Mr. Mr. Arnold had planned to make an ashtray from the metal. The military man took Mr. Arnold to a smelter's works and pointed out tons of material that he said was exactly like the fragments. It was only smelter slag that they found it at Murray Island, said the officer, smiling. Okay, that's all well and good. But Fortunately, somebody had sent Ray Palmer this book right here. Ray Palmer and Kenneth Arnold wrote this book. And Ray Palmer was the first UFOologist. What he did was when he heard about Arnold's case, he got in touch with him. When he heard about this case, he sent Arnold $200 and said, go find out about this case. It's not far from him. So Arnold went over there. When he got there, the military immediately began hassling. Now, this is before the military is supposed to know anything about UFOs. But two intelligence officers showed up. They bugged his room. They searched his stuff. They took away everything that he got off the island. They went and tried to discredit him. They, they, Ray Palmer, they, they, when he published information, they, the, the, all the magazines disappeared. They were after these people before there was supposedly any concern about UFOs. Fortunately, fortunately, one of the gentlemen, who by the way was both disappeared right after this case, had sent a cigar box of, of metal findings from this UFO which had dropped him on Murray Island, had, had sent a, one to, to uh, Ray Palmer. Ray Palmer had him analyzed. In that book is the analyzation. They were analyzed and they were found in high concentrates of calcium, iron, zinc, titanium. Middle concentrates of aluminum, magnesium, copper, magnesium, silicone. Low concentrates of nickel, lead, strontium, chromium. Traces of tin and calcium. Now, there's nothing unusual except for the high quality of calcium and titanium. That, that, that shouldn't have been. And it was nothing at all like samples from the sag. It was nothing like that at all. So once again, metal pieces, earthly components. UFO group says it's a, it's a hoax, but there has never been a dab of evidence offered that it's a hoax. They just accept it. Uh, to, to, to show you, to show you how, how this is, it says, here, here's, a, here's another quote from, uh, from, from John Keel in UFO's Trojan Horse, UFO's Operation Trojan Horse, the one I mentioned earlier. Quote, the flying saucers have been spewing all kinds of trash all over the landscape. We can start with the slag dumped from the sky during the Murray Island, Washington hoax of 1947. Analysis of the material showed it to be composed of calcium, aluminum, silicon, iron, zinc, and other Monday items. <coughs> elements. Heaps of this stuff have turned up since, since in New Hampshire, Michigan, Indiana, Pennsylvania, and many other places following UFO sightings. It has often been found on hilltops and deep and trackless forests, places where it had to be dumped from the air, and it was found in Switzerland in 1946." End quote. Now, what's going on? We've got stuff being dumped all over the country. We don't hear about that. But the case that really got me was, was the, the Billy Meyer case. Most of you probably are aware of the Billy Meyer case. Those that aren't, he's a farmer in, in uh, Switzerland who has seen hundreds of UFOs and, and taken hundreds of pictures. Uh, they've all been, you know, they've been studied by everybody in every phase of everything. Nothing can be found wrong with them. 
but yet ufologists say it's a hoax. Now there's a new book out. I just got it, I haven't read it, that supposedly explains a lot of it. I don't know. Each one of these cases that I've taken, one was 1896, one's 1947, the Billy Meyer case is 1980. So if one of them's wrong, you know, you can't group them together. Uh, he, the, one of the most interesting thing that happened to him was, was these, the people he supposedly met on, 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 these, on these beam ships, as he called them, gave him five pieces of metal. The five pieces of metal were supposedly the five steps towards making the shell on his UFO. He handed those metal, those pieces of metal, over to uh, to a, 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 a chemist named Vogel, who who is the man that invented the coating that's on the 3M floppy disk. He he's got 20, he owns 25 patents. He works for 3M. He's their head, some kind of scientist. Anyway. He's a metallologist. He studied these. What he said was that all the components of the fifth one, which, which was the most pure, all of the components were of this earth, but that they were <coughs> structured in such a way that we didn't have the technology, that, that, that it was some kind of cold metal fusion, and that there was one amount of, of, of metal so rare that wasn't even discovered in 1947, and it has something to do with atomic propulsion that was inside this little chunk of metal, and he has no way, no way of realizing where the guy could have got it. Now, all this fascinated me. I looked at the slides, I looked at the movies, I looked at Billy Meyer case, it looked ironclad. So I began calling around. I, first, I called, I called uh, some people at MUFON, and I said, uh, why is it that Bi uh, Billy Meyer case is, is, is known as a hoax? And they said, well, it's a, we know it's a hoax. And I said, well, how do we know it's hope? And they said, well, it's too good to be real. Okay, now here's some people that have been telling you for years, show me a clear picture. Mm -hmm. You show them a clear picture, it's too good to be real. Okay, so I said, well, let me track this further. So I called Wendell Stevens up on the telephone. Wendell Stevens, if, if some of you know him, he, he, he's the one that went to Sweden and investigated Billy Meyer case. He stayed with Billy Meyer for three years. He's the one that brought the evidence back. I said, Mr. Stevens, I said, I'm investigating this and I want to know why it is, you know. I've read all your books. I've read the other books. He said, "Well, he said when we brought the stuff back from from, from overseas, we decided that we were not going to hand it out to the UFO groups. That we were going to find unbiased investigators in film, in metallurgy, in each place. The metal, the the UFO groups kept telling us we should give it to them. We said, no, we're giving it. It's going directly, just like a police officer. The evidence goes directly from him to the lab." They said it's going directly through us to Billy Meyer to the lab. And immediately, immediately, my newsletter started coming in at that time that the Billy Meyer case was a fake. <coughs> okay? With no proof. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now what have we got? We've got pieces of metal laying all over the place that are of earthly origin. We've got scientists in, in, in France and, and our own, some of our own scientists saying that these things are not from <coughs> earthly place. And yet, every one of you in this room right now know when you think UFO, you think outer space. But it's as I said, they're, they're, they're putting it to us. I said, well, if they're not from outer space, I already knew about the hollow earth theory. It didn't make a bit of sense to me. Hollow earth, we all know it's molded lava. So that couldn't be the answer, but then Bender was looking at it. So I said, well, there's several different answers. There's, there's, there's some that believe that UFOs come from under the ocean. Uh, Ivan Sanderson wrote a fabulous book called Invisible Residence. Uh, one Wendell Stevens put out called UFOs from Underseas that tells all about <coughs> the UFOs that have been seen underseas. There's that, that idea. Then there's the idea that there may be from, from the jungles. I mean, uh, even our Pacific Northwest, thousands and thousands of miles of, of, of place where people don't go. If anybody's ever driven to Alaska like I have, I'll tell you right now, you can have a lot of UFOs out there. Okay, that's another idea. Then there's, then there's the hollow earth theory itself. So I decided to take this information, take the hollow earth information, and take it and see if it still held true. The last decent hollow earth book was written in the 60s. This is 1990. We've got a lot of information available. I mean, is, is this the most ridiculous idea you ever heard that the earth is hollow? Therefore, it shouldn't stand up today. No shape of the imagination. It doesn't exist. Let me add just one thing from the heart. Now, flight across the Atlantic 
uh, was a big test of a man. And they came up to the mark in every respect. And I am proud of them and proud to be one of them. They didn't make this flight for glory, but uh, purely for science and international amity. What, what it says at the top is there exists below everything that you see above. This is the, the question answered by Seneca uh, whenever he was asked what's inside the earth. He said there exists below everything that you see above. Mm -hmm. This is a 1995 quote from a magazine called The New Geophysics, which I just got my copy last week, uh, which explains all the new findings having to do with the interior of the earth. And this is their statement. What exists at the intersection of the core mantle may be a strange inverted landscape that in many ways resembles the landscape at the surface of the earth. He's saying, she's saying the exact same thing that Seneca said, only she's using more words because it's more modern, I guess. But she's saying there exists at the intersection, which is the this area right here. This is what's known as the delay. Now, according to the, to, to the accepted theory, this area here is molten or the core here. And this would be what they call the mound. According to the hollow earth theory, this is all atmosphere. This is the new findings. What they have found, before I even get to it, is mountains at this area inside the earth, where the hollow earth theory has always said they were, but where there's no room to fit in the accepted theory at all. What's that right in the middle of that sun? That's the sun, the center sun, the nucleus. So that's 100 miles across. Excuse me? The, the hollow earth theory, as, as you guys just heard from the other one, that's about as high as it'll go to, is, um, yeah, was, because, was, was first thought of by Marshall B. Gardner and, and Mr. Reed, who thought of it in 19, who wrote it out in 1903, and Mr. Gardner wrote it out and wrote out his belief in 1913 uh, simultaneously they came up with the exact same theory but they were using the same evidence. The theory is that earth and the planets are formed by nebula. In other words if you look at the different nebula you'll see that they're further out then closer and then they get closer and closer until you see the ring nebula which what, he, what the theory is is that this is the center sun and this is the earth forming. What the modern theory tells you is that the earth was formed by gravitational pull. The gravity pulled everything in and it became this nice neat layered ball, earth. What they didn't explain and what science has ignored admittedly for years is centrifugal force. What Gardner's theory says is that the very, very heavy stuff was pulled inwards into the center sun and that the other lighter matter was slung outwards to a point where gravity and centrifugal force repelled each other, which formed the outer crust. This is, this, this is just, this is his diagram before the mountains were placed on by my son on a cat. This explains exactly what would happen if you. People always ask, well, what about if you if you if you went into the center? Wouldn't you know it? You wouldn't know it because this gradual increase is so so small that you, the horizon would look the same as over here. As you went in further, as you reach this point, you see another another thing that that scientists tell us is that gravity comes from the center of the Earth. Actually, it's the mass that attracts. So if this was the mass of the Earth, it would attract gravity. As you came into the ocean, into the, as you came on a ship inside to this area, your compass would start to work erratic because it would be pointing down instead of to the north. This That's is why exactly what happened. Crazy. Excuse me? That's why a bird's compass went crazy. He threw that forker, you know, inside. Right. People cut off the engines, and they brought it on the air for power. That's right. He didn't have an engine. He just sit down like a bird. You know? That's right. But uh, 
also part of the theory, before we get any further, because now what I'm going to do is show you what I found out. Also part of the theory is that the northern lights are caused by the center sun hitting the edge of the ice pack, acting as a prism effect into the air, and that the movement of the northern lights is the interior clouds moving around the sun. By the way, scientists will have no idea what the northern lights are. <laughs> okay. These are some of the books, I just, some of my books out of my collection that have been written on the hollow earth. Uh, I put the UFOs from under sea in to show that there are also beliefs of that. The, the book here, The Hollow Earth, this book is by Raymond Bernard. You can get it from your library. But do not look for this book in UFO, 001. Don't look there. Because the government has a thing called Hide in Plain Sight. So if you want to find a Hollow Earth book, where would you look? You look under hard science. <coughs> you look under five, the, the Dewey number for this book right here is 551.11, which means inner structure, hard science. Okay? Now, when I went to look in Jacksonville, somebody told me that, and I, when I first went and looked for this book, it was right next to another book that said the theory of the makeup of the earth by a name about this long with about 25 numbers after it. So I said, well, let's compare them. I pulled it out and opened it. From page one to page 90 was nothing but one mathematical equation. So learn that, you know? <laughs> so these are just some of the books. There's, to let everybody know, there are tons of books available if you really start looking. Uh, the Phantom of the, of the Coals and The Journey to the Earth's Interior are the two that lay out the theory. The other people is the one that started me on the theory. The first thing I decided to investigate, because I decided to, to look into newer stuff, because we already knew what the old people said, and it seemed that every time they put out a new book, all they did was read it. <laughs> so the first thing I decided to look at was, what about this hole at the pole? This is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard of. That, that, that can't be. One of the things that they holler about constantly in UFO crowds is, is Admiral Byrd. They love to talk about Admiral Byrd. So uh, what I did was I read 50 books about Admiral Byrd and Arctic exploration. Jacksonville Library was donated by the Carnegies in 1903 after the fire. And so they have all these old books that they got from these rich libraries and they've got them <coughs> downstairs in the basement and they're slowly getting rid of them. But I was fortunate and they let me into them a few years ago. It's called The Stack. And I went in and I read 50 of the old books written before 1930. I was looking to see if there was any reference to Admiral Byrd's uh, as far as early exploration, first let me tell you, all of the mysteries that you've heard about the polar are there. They, they, they've seen two suns, they, they've gotten lost, they've seen tropical birds flying north. Uh, by the way, uh, animals migrate north. The white foxes and different animals, when they're on the ice pack, when it becomes winter, they go north, they don't go south. A lot of birds do also. But anyway, the main thing I was concerned with was Admiral Bird. So I, I looked, read everything he wrote, everything I could find about him. I only found one reference to any kind of thing that could have anything to do with him seeing anything on his first trip. It was in a book called Heroes of the Farthest North and Farthest South by Jake, Kenny, McLean, and Chelsea Frazier. It was a scholarly work of Arctic exploration up to the 1930s. And here's the quote. Quote, three hours after leaving the pole, they re-entered the explored regions. Up to that time, they had view viewed fully 10,000 miles of land never before charted by man, probably ever seen by him. Now, after reading that statement, I went to my globe and I could not find 10,000 miles of uncharted land anywhere near where he flew off, especially unknown. The other thing that, 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 that fascinated me was the fact that if we, had a, if we have a, a solid, solid planet, why was it that the geographical pole was not located where the magnetic pole was. Nobody could explain that. I read Gardner's book and he explained it. He says that the magnetic pole, as we saw on that poster, on that picture, would be in a circle at this lip right here. That's what he said. Well, if the geographical pole is here and the magnetic pole is here, that, that that's something to think about. So then I got to looking. I went to the, 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 the 
the New York Times for Monday, October the 20th, 1947. And I found this art, this on the first page. Quote, all Arctic is open to the Air Force, two new poles found, end quote, by Anthony Navira. And this is excerpts from the front page. Washington, October the 19th. The Air Force discloses, <laughs> discloses that it had discovered two new magnetic poles in addition to correcting the position of the one recorded by science. The three poles constitute an elliptical magnetic field, it was said. The exact location and latitude and longitude of these important discoveries in terrestrial magnetism were, were withheld for security reasons." End quote. So I got to thinking, what is an elliptical magnetic field? So I went to the dictionary, I looked up elliptical. It said an oval. So if you found, if you went over here and you found a magnetic pole, and then you came over here and you found one, and you found one over here, it seemed to fit. So I went a little further, and I read further in, and they, and they, then they started saying that well, there's a possibility that there are other poles, and that the whole thing is a pole. So who in school learned about three magnetic poles or, or a circle? Nobody. They they put this on you without. Not doing it. Another interesting point is when I was doing my research that I found out about the Earth is that the Earth rings like a bell. Some of you people probably know that. So this is yeah, Joseph. Yeah. So yeah. 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 Just like if you had a wine glass and you tap the side mm -hmm. during earthquakes. So this, is, this was Joseph Goodaverage reporting in his book, Astrology, the Science Age, the Space Age Science, excuse me. Quote, the ringing effect was recorded during the May 22, 1960 Chilean earthquake. The shock was so severe that the entire planet rang like a bell. The ringing <coughs> continued for a considerable length of time in a regular series of slow impulses which were recorded at various independent seismic stations, end quote. Also interesting, from Moongate suppressed findings of the U.S. space program by William L. Bryant II, we learned that some evidence points towards our moon being hollow and that it also rings like a bell. He stated, quote, the evidence provided by Apollo seismic experiments also points to conclude that the Earth is hollow and relatively rigid. So, what's going on? You know, it's not like I, like I was taught. I, I decided to, to, to look at modern proof. Let's see what we can find, okay? First is the photographic proof. proof. This is a picture that's very controversial in the, in the UFO and the, and the power field. This was published by Ray Palmer in his Flying Saucers magazine, June 1970. <clears throat> uh, I, I was in the Army when, when this magazine came out, and I heard about it, and I called Ray Palmer on the phone, and he sent me about 50 different magazines. Uh, but this was the one I wanted. This was taken from the SS-7 uh, weather satellite. And it's not, the first thing that, that, the, that the skeptics holler, well, that can't be a real picture, it's a composite. I agree. This is a composite of over 100 different weather photos taken in a 24-hour period because they never send a rocket over the Arctic. How many times has anybody ever seen a picture from the top of the Earth and the bottom? Never. They will not release them. This is the closest we've got. NASA, or nobody would say anything about this for years. It's, it's been a... a, a Back and forth, back and forth. The one thing I want you to notice before I move on to the next slide is if you look at this area right here, even though this is an old beat up magazine, if you look at this area right here, you can see how rugged and jagged it is. Now in those 50 Arctic books I read, when I read about the guys going in, into the North Pole, what they thought was the area of the North Pole, they always talked about having, we all think of it as a smooth sled ride. Actually, it's tall, jungled masses of, 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 of ice, some as big as two-story buildings and 20-story buildings, and you had to go in between it. And if you look at that, that's just exactly what this looks like. Now, the government didn't say anything about this picture for years. They, they wouldn't, you know, you can't get it anymore. But nobody would say where this picture came from. So they, about, oh, about five years ago, they finally came out with a statement for another person who was writing a, a, a Hollywood book. And they told him, well, that's because at that <coughs> time of the year, the sun doesn't reach this area. Well, that makes sense. Until you look at over 200 other pictures that they have, 
the dark tail at that time of year, and that's what they look like because the sun doesn't reach there, is a nice fade from light to dark. So that makes sense. The, the camera, this is dark because of the sun not reaching that far. That makes sense. But let's go back to that other picture now. And this way I get a little plug for my newsletter. That's off the cover of one of my newsletters. Now you have to excuse all the artwork, but that was our fun. The reason I use this one is because this is an original, and then this is a picture, an actual picture. You can see it's the right markup of the cover. So you can see this real close. You see this? Can you see that? That in no way is what they say it is. <clears throat> so that was that, that was another point. Now, remembering that the northern lights, according to the theory that was put forth in 1913, uh, many years before anything was up high enough to take a picture of our Earth, remembering that the northern lights are supposedly according to the hollow earth theory, the center sun shining off of the edge of that ice pack, in 1981, while living in Alaska, this came out. Scientists study first photos of aurora span. And I looked and I went, wow, man, if you took that other picture and you put it right behind this one, you would see that, wouldn't you? Yeah. I said, wow, well, I want one of them. So immediately that morning, I ran down to the newspaper office and I said, I want a copy of that picture because it's not clear enough in the paper. Yeah. Oh, but I made the mistake of telling them I was researching the hollow earth. Uh, so they told me that, that picture wasn't available. They had sent it across the street to their photo place. So I ran across the street. Well, we mailed this back to New York. And if you look on there, you can see my quotation, worldwide photo, Rockefeller, New York. I immediately called them. I said, hey, there's a picture published out here. Well, we need the number. I said, well. I got to looking at it, and I found the number. I found the number, I found the satellite it was off of, the time it was taken, the day it was taken, everything. I said, here it is. They said, well, you'll have to go to NASA. We can't give it to you. Oh. So for eight years, I called NASA. I picked different times, different people. Finally, I wised up, and I quit saying that I was studying the hollow earth theory. I said I was studying the origin of the northern lights, which is the same thing. Finally, a gentleman in there says, oh, I know where those pictures are, and they were in a place where you'd never expect. They were down at God in, in Houston. And this is the picture I got. That is Earth from outer space. You never see that one in your books, do you? That's like the Meyer photos. That's <coughs> phony. I'm, I took some oranges in a few <laughs> But anyway, that, that, nobody will explain that photo to me. And in, and in 1913, if you read Gardner's book, he'll describe that picture to you in his theory. Now, we get to the good part. How, how could it be, how could it be that we learn these things, just like the UFO, and, and, and this is what they told us the Earth was in the 70s. But, but how, how, could, how can we, how come is it that we agree with okay. Well, it's because in the, in the 1700s, teachers, and the wise men, as they called themselves, of Europe, who controlled the schooling, decided that science had to be controlled. That they had to put a control on science so that people wouldn't be running around and discovering things that they didn't want them to discover. Mm -hmm. So they, they picked up Gal Galileo Galilei. Mm -hmm. He came along with a statement, we must measure what can be measured and find a way to measure what cannot be measured. If it cannot be measured, it is not science. That destroyed UFOs. Pair, pair, uh, pair, you know, all these things. You, if you can't measure, it's not science, so therefore they, they ignore it. Uh, a, a man named Henry Cavendish came up with the, with the solid earth theory using the mathematics of Galileo. Okay? We all know what it is. But how did it get that way? Well, let's, let's go through it real quickly. In the, in the, in the mid-50s, if you, if you wanted to learn about the earth, you'd read a book called The Crust of the Earth, a popular introduction to geology. Quote, one of the outstanding seismological discoveries of recent years is the shelled character of our planet. At the center and outward, at the center and outward to a little more than one half of its radius, the Earth is homogeneous in high degree. This so-called core is surrounded by successive shells of layers of material, each shell out to a level about 30 miles from the surface, <coughs> and its material differs from the shell above or the shell below as well from the material of the center core, end quote. So in the 50s, they were telling us that the our Earth was like a jailbreak that it was a different layers. Now, this one here is from the next one. In the 70s, they changed their mind and they decided, now you've got to remember the hollow earth theory has not changed. One iota. 
since it was conceived. And in, in, in the 1973 book, Exploring the Planets, that's what this was out of. They tell us that there's, that there's a, uh, a 2,100 mile thick core, there's an 1,800 mile thick mantle, and a crust of less, less than 50 miles. That's what we were learning in school. And none of these school books say this is theory. They tell you that this is fact. This is the way it is. And that's the way it is. Yeah. That. So then in 85, I read Webster's Encyclopedia under Earth. The Earth constitutes of an inner core of solid iron surrounded by an outer core of molten iron. Surrounded this is a thick mantle, inner and outer, which is separated from the crust by the moho discontinuality, end quote. Where did that outer core of molten iron come from? Where did it come from? Let's, 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 let's look. It comes from a misconception that the deeper you go, the hotter it gets. Where does that misconception come from? Well, some of it might have to do with hell, burning in hell, casting the devil into the earth, as it says in the, in the Bible. Or it might also have to do with the way we were taught by our scientists. But is it always hotter? From Journey to Dirt's Interior by Marshall B. Gardner, the 1913 book, quote, Professor Ma of Bonn has written a very important paper on thermatic investigations of a 4,000-foot boring at Spurenberg, who finds that while there is an increase of temperature as we go down, the rate of that increase gets less and less all the time so that soon it will be nil. And the point at which the heat would cease to increase would be about 13,000 feet. That doesn't sound like it's hot, but wait a minute. That's a hollow earth book. Let's go look at another book. Let's look at this book. Let's look at a hole at the bottom of the sea, the story of the Moho Project. Most people know what the Moho Project was. It was the government took a lot of money to try to dig a hole through the 50 feet of crust to the mound. They never made it. The deepest hole we've ever dug is, a, is a, in Russia, and we've gone eight miles. Uh, but anyway, from, from a hole at the bottom of the sea, the story of the Moho Project, 1961, by William Bascom. Quote, we come to the question of the actual temperature at various depths and at the center of the earth. Because heat travels slowly and the great depths will always be inaccessible, it is possible that man will never have a very accurate answer. In the crust, remembering that the crust is the 50 mile mm -hmm. outer layer, in the crust where heat transfers entirely by conduction, it is relatively simple matter to measure the increase in temperature with depth and lay it down. Either in continents or beneath the oceans, the answer is the same. There is an increase of 30 degrees centigrade per kilometer of depth in the outer crust. However, as the depth becomes greater, the rate of increase is smaller. In the outer mantle, which is the area below the crust, in the outer mantle, the, ter the thermal gradually decreases rapidly to about a tenth of that in the crust, and as the depth continues to increase, the change is even more gradual. So there you go. What happened? Where'd they get the heat? They have no evidence. People immediately are going to say, well, I get that. <coughs> Devon. Everybody says, well, it's deeper than this you go. From a book called Inner Earth, A Search for Anomalies, 1991, a scientific book used by scientific people, USSR. Early reports from Kola Peninsula, that's the peninsula I was trying to name, indicated that densities did indeed, did indeed increase with depth <coughs> initially, but at 14,800 feet, the drill encountered a sudden decrease in density. So therefore, there goes that. But how come they came up with this whole, this, this whole idea of a, of a, of a, of a, of a center, center thing? Well, some people say, what about volcanoes? A lot of people say that. But volcanoes, set above hot spots, and it's, it's a proven fact and there's no connection to it. Uh, this, is from, this is from a geology textbook called The Earth Past and Present, quote, magma or molten rock material forms in isolated pockets at relatively shallow depths of a few kilometers to a few tens of kilometers, end quote. I've searched everywhere, I can find no report of magma that has been found from deeper than 15 miles. Now. Let's get back to this hollow, this hollow. Here we've got it here on this one. Liquid outer core. Where did this come from? Where did this come from? The liquid outer core. Actually, if you get rid of that liquid outer core, you've got the hollow earth theory. Mm -hmm. So that's all we have to get rid of. Is that what happened to it? Well, you see all these. What, what happened was when, when science started realizing they could use seismology reports to find out about the inner earth, they ran into problems. They started to run into problems. They didn't find this jawbreaker. You know, they, they, they didn't know what to do. Because here, here, here's why. Well, so did I find it. 
Let me go back over this slide. Here's why. The waves you see up there, the L waves, there's L waves, P waves, and S waves. I don't think there's any L waves on that chart. But L waves are shallow waves. That, that's what caused the buildings in our rock during earthquakes. The S waves will only move through rigid, solid material such as rock. The P waves will move through any material. So what happened was no waves, no, the P waves, which will travel through anything, were coming on through. But the S waves, which will only travel through rock, weren't making it through this area right here for some reason. And so they said, well, why can't that be? You know, if, if, the, if the earth is solid, it's going to have to come all the way through. Why is it not coming through this area right here? So they had to sit down and figure that one out. Uh, this is from the this is from the geological textbook, the one I told you earlier, the Earth Past and Present, which is a reputable textbook. Quote: Geophysicists utilize all their utilizing all their data and their model of the Earth explanation for these incidents. The boundary between the mantle and the core is at such a depth that the earth waves travel their arc-shaped paths can travel 11,000 kilometers without hitting the core. Since they didn't make it beyond 11,000 kilometers. The logical conclusion, this is from their book now, is that the core is liquid, completely damping out the S waves and slowing the P waves. This geophysicist think that the inner core is solid with a liquid outer core. Now I disagree with that. The logical conclusion is that there is no rock in this area. That's the logical conclusion. Why, why is the logical conclusion that it's hot and molten? They have no proof of that. They just made that up to fit their theory. Now, I thought, now this I found, this, this, this is old stuff. Then things really started to happen. This is the heat shield that I was telling you about where, they, where, where, earth, where, uh, where volcanoes come from. It's a sheet, that's, this is brand new, this is in the latest issue. And it, it's a sheet underneath Europe and, and that. And it's hot and hot. This issue of, of first, it, first, the first thing that happened was a time release, a time press release of February 22, 1993. Quote, nuclear test reveals a subterranean continent. A Chinese 66 megaton nuclear test revealed a continent 2,000 miles underground. Studies of the shock waves by two scientists at the U.S. Geological Survey found a region 200 miles across and 80 miles deep that is denser than surrounding regions. The implication? The core mountain boundary may be as complex as the Earth's surface. And this is the scientific magazine that that was found in. From this same article, sign, uh, from this article, Scientific American, May 1993, the core mantle boundary by Raymond Jen Lotson and Thorne Gray. The core mantle region may actually be the most geological active zone of the Earth. In fact, the physical changes across the interface between the core and the mantle are more pronounced than those across the planetary surface separating air from rock. I said, well, there, that's unbelievable. What he's saying is that the surface of the earth is the same as the surface along this area. So I went and I started looking back in history and see if I could find anywhere else this was mentioned. I found one reference in December 18, 1986, in the new sci a copy of the New Scientist. Quote, in 1986, O. Gunmanson et al. presented their seismic topograph of the core mantle boundary at a meeting of the American Geophysic Union. The gist of their presentation the geophysicists found that the core boundary is drawn upwards to form mountains under eastern Australia, the central North Atlantic, Northeast Pacific, Central America, and Southeast Asia. The boundary is pushed downwards into valleys beneath the South, Western Pacific, the East Indies, Europe, and Mexico. These features are as high or deep as 10 kilometers. So, what we're talking about is the D layer, which is right here. Which, if you believe in the, the accepted theory, this is a liquid mass. If you believe in the hollow earth theory, this is atmosphere, and there are mountains here, just where it's always said they were in the hollow earth theory. However, our scientists are having a hard time with that one right now. Uh, Associated Press story followed that with this. The boundary between Earth's molten iron core and the underlying rock mantle may be an upside-down version of the planet's surface. 
because these layers are like an upside down image of continents and oceans on the planet's surface, California Institute of Technology geophysicists Brad Hager and other scientists call them continents or oceans. Not surprisingly, the report states, the new research which Hager and other scientists will outline this week at the American Geophysical Union's annual meeting further complicates the traditional simplistic <coughs> picture that Earth's thin crust surrounds a molten iron core. In August of 1995, we'll get us this one. Now, this, this, this cover is a hollow earther's dream. Look, you've got the sun shining out of the earth, inner earth exposed, iron winds and upside down mountains. It's all there. It's all there, bud. And this is from that article. It's an article from Anner Matters, and it was inserted, excerpted from The Naked Earth, the, the book I told you guys about, by, by Sean Gravago. Okay, it says, Lay's fresh approach, this is the, this is the gentleman who found it, Thorne Lay, that, that found this information. Lay's fresh approach to the seismic data give a tangible shape to previous vague ideas about how the core mantle layer looks. As a result of his efforts, a majority of geophysicists are now believers. Not all of them have lined up behind Lay's idea of continents, but most researchers would argue that there's some sort of train down there begging for further scrutiny. An upside-down version of Earth's surface that exists below everything that you see above. This is, another, is a picture of those upside-down mountains as presented in, in, with that art. Now let's turn it over right way and see what it looks like. There, my friends, is a scene of the inside of the earth, as reported and, and uh, documented by the geophysicists. So there you have it. This is my drawing of the hollow earth. Anybody that believes in the, the other part of the other theory can just take this off and write hot, molten lava, but I'd like to know where they got it. <laughs> Her, that was my trip to Olive Earth, and again, I plug my magazine by saying <coughs> thank you guys for going with me. Thanks very much.
Americans look with an abiding faith to the future. For many, citizen and scientist alike, atomic energy means the promise of a more abundant life. But for many another, the atom is a threat, an evil promise, the paralyzing panic of our time. Thus, to answer the perplexing question of the atom and its implications, the people have turned their attention to the Forum of Public Affairs, have sought to search out reality, to find the facts, or to listen to men of science, like Dr. Jeremiah Morley, famed geologist, the embattled founder of the now defunct Society to Save Civilization. It was Morley who told a Los Angeles audience that a series of atomic explosions, either accidental or deliberate, could set off a chain reaction to annihilate every man, woman, and child on the face of the earth. It could cause the death of every living thing. In a gloomy report, Morley took a dim view of history, recalled the tragically repetitious story, the decline and fall of all past civilizations. Said Morley, modern civilization could, by the phenomenon of atomic fission, be brought to dust and ashes. For example, if an A-bomb were detonated at the Empire State Building, the area of total destruction would cover an area of two miles. Now, since the A-bomb is already obsolete, consider the area of total destruction of an H-bomb. And science has promised us bombs a thousand times more powerful, poisoning with radioactivity all the air and water of this earth. This could mean not only the end of our own civilization, but the very possibility of any future civilization. What are we going to do about it? I'll tell you what I am going to do about it. I have a plan, a plan to preserve human life on this planet. I hope you will join with me in carrying it out. The response to Dr. Morley's appeal was immediate and enthusiastic. The Society to Save Civilization was set up. To its headquarters flocked amateur do-gooders and professional scientists. From them, Morley chose a staff of experts. Dr. Max A. Bauer, eminent geophysicist ousted by Hitler from the University of Munich in 1933. Dr. James Paxton, metallurgical engineer, twice winner of the McKenna Scientific Award. Joan Lindsay, medical doctor and ardent feminist, who, for her research in biochemistry, was named winner of the annual award by the American Confederation of Women Scientists. Dr. George Coleman, authority on soil conservation, and Andrew Ostengard, sand hog, explosives expert, marine veteran of World War II. It was this team, qualified each in his own way, that helped set in motion Morley's audacious project, a daringly planned program, which he took three months later to the board of directors of the Carlisle Foundation. And so my colleagues and I believe that humanity can escape annihilation, can find a temporary haven, a promise of hope that Come what may, life can be sustained deep within the earth itself. Far below the surface, we shall seek a natural, a geological shelter. We have a team ready for the effort. All we lack are funds. Can we get them from your foundation? Dr. Morley, I believe it would expedite matters if I were to ask the question. We're a layman, you know. First of all, isn't the inside of the earth solid? The interior of the earth is made up of vast caverns joined by natural avenues uh, leading from the surface. Natural avenues? Funnels and fissures. Such a fissure lies within the world's largest extinct volcano at Mount Nelly. That is where we intend to start our journey. Oh, the, these funnels, how far down do they go? Hundreds of miles, perhaps thousands, to the very core of the earth. But isn't the inside of the earth, the very core, a molten, fiery mass? To the contrary. The latest body of theory holds that the inside of a sphere, such as the Earth, is cooler than the temperature at its surface. And how would you traverse these thousands of miles? As Dr. Coleman, the perspective drawing equipment. This is a cyclotrans. A what? It's an amphibious conveyance based on the principles of ovoidal atmosphere. A what? Like a submarine with the mobility of a tractor. Its head 
contains a burrowing device. This wall can withstand extremes of temperature and pressure. But even with the cyclotram or the uh, atmosphere of the whatnot, how do you know you'll be successful in finding this underground haven? We don't know. But we must try. There is no other alternative, no other course, no other hope of keeping the spark of life alive. And uh, the cost? Money, Dr. Morley. Well, surely you don't expect us. But we do. I know you and your committee mean well. Mean well? Next to be calling a starry eyed idealist. Dr. Lindsay, you're out of order. The whole world is out of order. And I suppose you and your associates can set it right? We couldn't have said it wrong if we tried. The appropriation was denied. To carry on his work, Dr. Morley issued repeated appeals to the members of the organization. It failed. And so, last week, the Society to Save Civilization was itself extinct. And one of its leaders, of Professor Jeremiah Morley and his enthusiastic colleagues. Where were they headed after a year of devotion to a lost but spectacular cause? To newsreel reporters, Dr. Morley had only this to say. We have no plans. We have no hope.
part of the ravine. The at an angle of not more than 33 degrees.
Outside temperature is rising fast, up 280 degrees now. It looks as if it could go on forever. what we're looking for. Let's make a landing and explore the area.
Here you are, Doc. Two souvenirs from Haiti. Vacation land of the underworld. Thank you. Back home, I'll be the envy of every kid on the block. I'm not so sure, Joe. Take a cape for a little sunlight. Turns gray and ugly. And the flowers? It'll crumble to dust. We can build a new life right here. You mean this is what we're looking for? You'll get used to it. Well, who wants to get used to it? Why don't we go on a little further? But we've come 1,100 miles already. How can you measure what we've been through in miles? I say let's go back or go on. But this is no place. What is your wish? We've come so far. Let's go on. This must be a continuation of the other river. No, I think it's just the seepage from it. Good fertilizer for our crops. Crops? Let's face facts. 
Molly. This is a desert. The very word means deserted by life. And you talk about crops. It can be irrigated. This country has everything. Water, soil, air, heat. Yeah, you're forgetting one thing, though. No sunlight. Science can adjust that. Crops can fly without sunlight. Perhaps. But can we? the causes. Our investigations have been checked, tests rechecked. Examination of genetic tissue proves that all experimental animals born here are sterile. You know what this means? This new world. A haven for the dead. This is the end of the line. Now we know that the human race cannot reproduce itself in this underworld region. It appears our uh, mission is a failure. Then we can't stay here. At least one generation could. And after that, what? The end of humanity. That I won't accept. Neither can you run away from facts.
Something's pulling us down. I feel like I'll live 